Salt Company, what's going on? My name is Mark Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a privilege to hang out with you guys tonight. Bring the word. During the, um, the ACDC, like, pump music, pump up music, like, getting you hyped for the conference, I was a little torn because Ryan was underwhelmed by your response. You have to know this, like, when I grew up uh, in Christianity, like, I remember as, I, as a kid, there was this movie that came out, it was like a documentary that all the Christians watch. It was called something like Hell's Bells, you know, and it, it featured bands like ACDC, you know, like if you, if you spin their records backwards, it says like satanic messages. And so here we are all these years later, like, let's rock, you know, let's get ready for the conference. So um, I'm okay, I was a little underwhelmed by it, but that you guys weren't whatever. So um, anyway, no, I think it's, it's all good. And um, I'm excited for the conference. I'll be hanging out there uh, with you guys um, and uh, doing a little breakout thing on prayer. So don't feel obligated. You guys, if you come to Veritas, you hear me a lot. So go listen to some of the other speakers. It'll be great. Tonight we're talking, we're continuing um, our study through Exodus. You guys have been going through Exodus. And here's, here's a question that I often ask people is this question um, what is the Bible about? People mostly, like if you were to ask some stranger they, that maybe uh, is not a Christian, they, they feel like they probably have good reasons for why they're not a Christian, right? And so most people assume that they understand the Bible. But if you ask them a question like, what's the Bible about? Most people or many of the people that I've talked to over the years would say something about the Ten Commandments, And then if you ask them, like, you know, it's usually like, well, it's about being a good person. You know, the Ten Commandments. You're like, okay, sweet. What are the Ten Commandments? And usually they get like one or two of them. Like, don't murder, don't steal or whatever. And so you're like, okay, so that's what you think the Bible and the story of Christianity is about, the Ten Commandments. Like, yeah, that's that's what it's about. Well, if that's their answer, I don't say this to them, but you actually couldn't be more wrong if that's what you think the Bible's about. Let me tell you, tonight we're gonna talk about the story of the Bible and, and we're telling it through the story of the 10 Commandments, but how we miss the whole entire point of the 10 Commandments when we usually talk about them. Now, let me try to tell you the story of the Bible through a story, even through a picture, if I could, okay? So I'm gonna take you back to the fall of 1999, This is the fall of 1999. Look at me. Uh, Fall of 1999. So I was 22 years old and just graduated from college. And this this woman in Salt Company that had captivated me, um, I did not captivate her. So it was kind of a whole chase for the whole year. Um, But Letha Ann Sternberg, and I'm, this is, I'll tell you the story sometime about our engagement as hilarious. I almost killed her. Um, it involved ponies and, and pony wagons and all that stuff, and it's crazy. But here we are getting engaged. Our whole life is before us. You know, you think about getting married, and, and, and you just dream about, like, what, what is our life together going to look like? She said yes. Um, so what's our life going to be like? You know, we're excited to have a family But here's a question. At this stage, why would anyone want to have children or a family? Why would anyone want to start a family? You know, there's actually countries where they can't get people to have kids and have a family. But like, why do people dream about like, oh, well, having kids someday? Well, the answer, of course, is simple. We couldn't wait for the day that we had a bunch of little minions to do all the stuff we wanted them to do, right? We were so excited to start a family because we had all these rules we wanted to throw down on these little people. That's what we're dreaming about right here, right? It's the rules. We wanted to be in charge. So here we are, uh, 
23 years later, whatever, however long later it is. There's our family. We got, it's so hard to get a family picture. I had to get a friend. He took a picture in the foyer afterwards. Um, we don't always look good. We, we did plan on it. That's the best we could do. Here we are, our family, and look at all those little minions. All those people to just do what, and, and it works perfectly, right? We just tell them what to do. They just do all the stuff we want, right? Here's the thing. Of course, that's an absurd thought. Like nobody starts a family for that reason. Why did we start a family? The relationships, right? Like it's not always as perfect as this picture might be, right? Life is messy and all that, but it's like, it's relationships. It's people. People are like, are you doing a Super Bowl party? I'm like, yes, every night is a party at our house, right? Because a bunch of teenagers and we're like doing stuff, playing games. Like it's, I love this season of life. It's like I have all my best friends like living in our house and it's cool. But here's the thing. This is the story of, in a sense, the Bible. Why did God create the universe? What's the Bible about? It's, it's about a bunch of rules, like, do you see how that completely misses the point of why we exist and why we're here? Here's the point, if you're taking notes. God created you for relationship, not rules. Exodus 20 is our passage, the Ten Commandments. And it begins with this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below. I'm the, let's think about how this starts. If you ask people to quote the Ten Commandments, even if they know the commandments, I almost guarantee they will not start the way the 10 commandments start. How does it start? It starts with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This is so important. If you remove this one little verse from the 10 commandments, this one little verse that gives context, you will completely miss the point of all the Ten Commandments. Think about the order of this. Think of where we've been. Think about last week. Remember the Passover, the blood. God's people are in slavery. The book Exodus, what does it mean? I mean, we see exit signs. What does X mean? It means out of. Exodus, God bringing his people out of what? Slavery. How did he do it? How did God do it? You remember the story, right? Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments. He hands it to the Israelites while they're in slavery. And he's like, start obeying the law. And when we obey the law fully, God will part the sea and get us out of here, right? Some of you are like, are you serious? That's how it happened? No, it did not happen that way. How did it happen? God rescued them based on nothing good that they had done. He just came in saved them, parted the Red Sea, brought them out, and then we get the Ten Commandments. The order matters. God does not save them based on their ability to keep the law. He saves them by grace. The rescue came before the rules. So, Again, the Ten Commandments in context is this. This is the first point you want to write down. The, the last one was kind of the, the big idea. This first point here is remember command number zero. Rescue comes before rules. Command number zero is I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. The rescue part, that comes before any rule. Amazing grace comes first. Sometimes I've heard people say, I can't get baptized because I need to clean up my act first. I need to stop going down to the ped mall and getting wasted before I can get baptized. I need to stop all these bad behaviors before I get baptized. Here's the point, you can't, right? 
you can't keep all the commands perfectly before you give your life to Jesus, right? You just come to him, he rescues you, and what comes next is, is the obedience, the rules part. So I have a, uh, one of my dear friends, best friends, uh, Drew Stevenson. He's a, he was the salt director here for a number of years and then went to plant a church up in Minneapolis. And uh, while he was in Iowa City, he and his wife, uh, they adopted a couple of kids, Luke and Emma, from the Congo. Uh, Drew was in the Congo for 40 days, and he would say it was like 40 days of total hell, right? With, I mean, he was with his mom trying to stay in this little room with these two little toddlers and kids um, for 40 days trying to get these kids out of the Congo, and they weren't like letting them go. They weren't letting these kids leave. They had all these documents. Well, they ended up getting out of the Congo. They, they rescued him. But here's the question. If you were to, if you were to ask um, Drew, or the, imagine this, uh, some years later as these kids grow up, they, they ask Drew and Melissa, their, their parents now, uh, why did you rescue us? And what if Drew and Melissa's response was, well, we... You guys didn't have very good rules. We wanted you to have better rules than the orphanage, right? That's why we saved you. No, of course not. We saved you for relationship. You, we love you. You have a new identity now. You're, you're a part of our family, no longer orphans. You're loved. So now what? These, these children are saved from the Congo. I still remember the picture of Drew coming down and and the children running into Melissa's arms for the first time. It was just a beautiful scene to be there for it in the Des Moines airport, and, and these children running. And here's what I want to say, guys. Those kids were adopted, and they lived happily ever after. Right? Uh, not really. We talk regularly. And do you know what? The rescue part, the 40 days in the plane ride home, was the easy part. The hard part is when they got home and teaching them to live like a Stevenson. That's where the rules come in. It's like this is what our household is like. It's actually not just a free-for-all. It's not... Welcome to America, home of the free, cookie jars over there, whiskey in the cabinet downstairs, right? Live and let live, you do you, you be you, and you just kind of raise yourself because you're free from that slavery and orphanage. No, what do you do? You create rules and boundaries and you teach them how to live like a Stevenson. That's what true freedom is, right? To live in relationship with the family, with the mom and the dad, right? So here's the second point. Rules are a description of what life as a child of God looks like. That's the whole point of the rules. They describe what life as a child of God looks like. So you guys know this, right? All of you in your family, you guys in your house have things that you might call really bad ideas. In our house, we have a, there's, there's things we would call really bad ideas like this. Here's examples of really bad ideas in our house. Hey, let's start a fire in the living room. That's a really bad idea, right? Or, hey, let's get on dad's computer and just buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon. That's a really bad idea. Hey, let's make a snowboard ramp that goes all the way into the street and launches us through that dangerous intersection. Like things that have kind of all happened in our house. Um, (laughs) These are really bad ideas, right? And I'm always shocked at the rules that I have to come up with. Like, hey, guys. Like, no fires outside of the fireplace, right? Just stating the obvious. One of my kids 
uh, Beck when he was a little toddler. He was running around the house with a fork in his mouth, just running around. Like, do we have to have rules about this? Slammed into a wall. And I, I have like ER doctors in Veritas. I have their numbers in my phone. I'm like calling them like, what do we do? It's, you know, it's got a fork jet. It's terrible. We have to come up with rules for this kind of stuff, right? Like, this is not how we want to live in our house, okay? So, here's how I want us to look at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are ten really bad ideas of things to do in God's household. So, the first one is verse 3. Do not have other gods besides me. So let's state that rule or that command as a really bad idea. Really bad idea number one is this. Put other things above God. You know, God of the universe, creator God, take him And just like put other things above him. That is a really terrible idea. Ultimately, all the commands that we're going to read, the rest of the nine, they find their place under the context of this command. All sin boils down to a violation of this command. So let's do, some of you are like, Okay, other gods. I, I don't uh, think that I worship other gods. So, so how can you identify a, a false god in your life? Let's do a litmus test. Okay, litmus test number one. What consumes your time, money, energy, your thoughts? What are the things that just consume those aspects of your life? Another way you could find out what your what you might put above God is, is finish the statement, I can't be happy without blank. So let's do a little, let's do a little, uh, a little test of, of right now. So we're going to do this little, little game. We'll call it a game. It's going to be super fun. Okay. Close your eyes real quick. So just a little, what are my God's litmus test? Okay, imagine everything in your life in your hands, okay? Now, just, just do this for a minute. Your eyes are closed. This is weird. But just kind of, like, imagine every single thing that you own that are in your hands. You got your two hands and you got your two fists, right? Now, I want you to kind of open up your hands for just a second. Just open them up. And, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm coming, I'm coming to your seat right now. And, and I'm going to take, I'm going to start taking stuff. I'm going to start with your season tickets. All right, I'm taking your season tickets, your Hawkeye tickets. And you're like, no big deal, because I don't have any anyway. So you're, it's fine. You can have them. Some of you are like, ah, yeah, I already did that. I had to do concessions. It was terrible. All right. <laughs> Next thing, I'm coming. I'm coming for your, uh, hey, can I, can I take your, uh, your moped? You know, just I'm taking the keys. I'm taking your moped. You're like, oh, hey, this is no. Taking that, uh, your car, like I'm coming and I just took your car. Okay, I'm taking your, your phone. I'm taking your phone now. So now you, you're like, all right, this, how does it feel if I just take your phone away? Uh, you're, Now I come for your bank account, take all your money, right? Your hands are still open. I'm just taking all your stuff. Um, I'm taking your, what about your job? Hey, I'm going to take your your major. Like something is going to happen and you're not going to be able to study that anymore. You're not going to have that career path. You're not going to make it into that school, uh, whatever, then it starts coming, I start coming for your friends. Then now we're getting into your relationship. So now I'm taking your boyfriend away, taking your girlfriend away, 
taking your husband away, your wife away. Like all of a sudden, you, you know, at some point, um, your hands start to, to close a little bit. And that thought of like, I can't be happy without that. Yeah, you could take my phone, you could take my, you can open your eyes. So, so at some point, your, your idol is, is that thing in your hand that you're like, um, no, you can't have that thing. What does Jesus say? He says, um, if anyone wants to come after me and be be my disciple, they must take up their cross and follow me. Otherwise, you can't follow me. It's, it's, It's everything. It's bringing our entire life to Jesus Christ and saying, have it all. And all of us have that thing in our life that if God comes for it, we're like, hmm. No, I don't think so. He goes on in verse four, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them. Do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing faithful love to, th- to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Really bad idea number two is worship the God of your imagination. When it comes to religion, what's the one thing that you can't be wrong about? Like, you can be wrong about a lot of things, but if you get this one thing wrong, it doesn't matter what else you get right, because you're wrong. So one thing, this is the question, who is God? If you get God wrong, it doesn't matter all the other things you get right, you're just wrong, right? He says here that he's a jealous God. That doesn't mean he's, he struggles with envy and insecurity, like, he's just jealous, uh, In that way, what it means is that he is fiercely protective of who he is. He cares about what we say about him. If we sing songs that are not true about God, he takes personal offense at that. He's a jealous God. He takes his name seriously. And idolatry is when we make God into someone he's not. It's not just making, carving out a statue and worshiping it. That would certainly fall under this. But it's also the images we craft in our minds of who God is. Sometimes you've heard people say, my God would never, dot, 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 right? My God would never, Send anyone to hell. My God would never tell anyone that that's a sin. My God would never do this or that thing. That is a form of just worshiping the God of our imagination. Verse 7, the third command. He says, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Okay, really bad idea number three, commandment number three, flippantly slap God's name on stuff. Just flippantly throw God's name out there. Now, this could be, you know, you're screaming out, GD, you know, you're cursing stuff. God damn that, damn that. Like, you're cursing things. That's, that's a horrible thing to say. It's just like, God damn you. God send you to hell, right? That or Jesus Christ as, a, as an expletive swear word. But there's another way that we do this, I think. It's when we just slap God's name onto something to justify ourselves. Like, hey, um, I just feel like God doesn't want me to be in this connection group anymore. Like, just, just rather say, instead of using God's name on it, just say, yeah, I'm just not feeling it don't love the group, or I'm really busy in studying, but to put God on it, or in dating, like, hey, God 
said I should ask you out. Like, probably don't do that. Um, or I just don't feel like God wants me to be with you. Uh, I don't know. That could be true. Some of you are like, that was a good line. I used it. I, I mean... Be careful about just slapping God's name on something to justify yourself. I hear people talk about the Crusades. You guys study history, talk about the Crusades. Can you believe all the bad things the Christians did? Well, just because someone slaps a Jesus bumper sticker on their horse doesn't mean they're representing Jesus Christ, right? That also is a form of taking God's name in vain, putting a... a, I saw Jesus with an American flag in the American flag colors or Jesus and Trump or Jesus and Biden or whatever. Like, don't slap Jesus' name on stuff flippantly. This is a form of taking God's name in vain. Verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days, do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, female or male or female servants, your livestock or the resident alien who's within your gate, city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Really bad idea number four is just work nonstop. Work nonstop. Don't take a day of rest. Just study all the time. Work all the time. 24-7. Just work seven days a week. I'm in awe of people who see the Ten Commandments as a burden. Do you see the irony in that? God is commanding these people who were just slaves working 24-7 in Egypt. Hey, yo, one of the things about living in my house is you got to rest. No, what a burden. We like being slaves working all the time. God's like commanding rest. He's telling you, it's okay. In my house, you're not a slave. If you're too busy to take a nap because everything in your life depends on it, you've got bigger problems than that test coming up, right? If you can't take a day of rest, and you know what a day of rest does for you? Is it, it's a way of trusting God, and, and God says, hey, I got this. I'm going to take care of you. Just Rest. And watch me go to work. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Really bad idea number five, disregard your parents. He says you will live long in the land. When you obey your parents, you decrease your chances of dying because of stupidity, right? You're probably, by obeying your parents, not going to be playing in the street. Probably not going to end up in a car with the driver who's drunk, right? Because they've talked to you about friendships. They've talked to you about the kind of people you want to be around, the kind of things you should be doing and not doing. And so I know this is a little complicated for you because what does this look like for you as a 18, 19, 22, 23-year-old, are you under your parents' authority? That's a good question. Are they paying for your college? Are you depending on them? Are you dependent on them? Those are some questions to think about. My encouragement to you is to include them in the big decisions in your life. Seek your parents' advice. And some of you, even if your parents don't love Jesus, they still love you probably more than anyone on earth, and they care about you. And so seek their counsel. And when you go home, show them that Jesus has changed your life, not just because you got baptized 
and you know all this great theology, show them you're a Christian because you make your bed, because you do the dishes, right? Honor your parents. Don't disregard them. He goes on, and now we're going to hit some quick hitters. Verse 13, do not murder. Really bad idea number six, make sure people get what you think they deserve. This comes from Matthew 5, where Jesus connects the command not to murder with anger, grudges, bitterness. Sometimes we think, you know, this, this summarizes it. The Ten Commands, don't murder. Like, if I don't do that, I get to heaven. Like, I'm going to die, and God, I get there, and I'm like, I didn't kill anyone. He's like, sweet, you're totally in, right? That's not the point here. The point is Jesus wants to poke at the anger in our hearts, the person that wronged us, and we want to kill them. We want to hurt them. Someone, if I'm driving with my son, uh, I've got, uh, my son Makai has got his learner's permit. We'll be driving, and somebody will cut us off. And I'm like, Makai, speed up and get around them. Why, Dad? I need to look at them, <laughs> right? I need to see them and let them know. I won't give them the middle finger, but I can do it well with my eyes. Like, yeah, you know what's up. And it's actually hilarious. This is such a funny story. Um, we were at the mall, and he's like, this, he was just getting started. He's way better now. But he's like, every turn is like really jerky and slow, and he doesn't know when for sure to go on the stop sign. And we come to the stop sign at Coral Ridge Mall. It's like super busy, you know. And, you know, you come to the stop, and we're like, like, wait, wait, go, go. And he just slams on the gas and he takes off right in front of somebody. Well, this person did not take kindly to that. They peeled out as soon as we got to, we got to the stop. And as soon as they could come around, they're just like, Boop! you know, just spun right out next to us. Just almost sideswiped us, looked at us, middle finger and all, eye contact with me and all my kids at this person. And one of my kids is like, hey, that's Miss Sally from Veritas. And I was like, no way. I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, this is amazing. Like we totally got flipped off by this like really good family friend. And I mean, she just like took a quick left. Like she's like, you know, turned around and was... And, and at the whole time, I was like, they were all laughing. They're like, oh, it was Miss Sally. There, it wasn't Miss Sally. It's a different person. I mean, it, this really happened, but her name's not Sally. And, um, and I, I, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I also thought it was her, but I'm like, no, it wasn't. The next day in church, oh, you can't make this up. She comes up <laughs> with her head. Like, it just came over to my kids, and she totally owned it in such a beautiful, cool way. She's like, I'm like, that wasn't you. She's like, it totally was. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Some little 14 year old who's just learning to drive, you know, cuts you off and now it just draws out your rage and anger. That's a terrible idea. 14, do not commit adultery. Really bad idea number seven, if it feels good, do it. You know where Jesus takes this in Matthew 5, talking about lust. Could be, I mean, the low-hanging fruit here is internet pornography. Maybe it's a fantasizing about being with this girl or this guy, dreaming about what my life would be like if I had him or her, just, and, and if it feels good, just do it. Like, we all have these desires, and you just got to do you, so just go do it, right? That's, that's actually a really bad idea. Verse 15, do not steal. Really bad idea number eight, take stuff that's not yours. Psalm 24 says, the earth belongs to the Lord, the earth and everything in it. Think about this. In God's household, why would we need to steal if he owns everything? 
doesn't make sense in God's household to steal stuff. Uh, verse 16, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Really bad idea number nine, tell the truth, sort of. Just fudge the truth, spin it a little bit, exaggerate it a little bit. A guy bought a car from me, sold it to him for like 2000 and on the, on the where you have to, uh, for tax purposes, bill of sale, he's like, hey, can you just put like 1000 there? I'm like, no, I actually can't because my signature is going to be on here and I can't lie about this, right? What's the big deal? Why wouldn't you help me? Save me some tax money, right? No, don't give false testimony. Verse 17, do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This, this, uh, this Hebrew word hamad is like to desire something earnestly, to long after it. Um, I, I picture staring. Like if you're longing at something, you're drooling and you're staring at it. What's more embarrassing than, get caught in, than get when you get caught staring at someone or something, right? Uh, really bad idea number 10 is, is keep staring at social media. <laughs> this command is about coveting all this stuff that you want that you, that's not yours. Just, just keep staring. Like just scroll and stare and look at everyone else's amazing life and all the clothes that you want, the cute haircut that you want. All the, oh, look at, look at their family. Oh, they're on vacation. And oh, that's, oh, this is, you know, and just stare at it and just take it in. That's worked really well for our culture, right? People are super happy, right? No, obviously, that's a really bad idea. Okay, so here's where we land. These 10 Commandments, what life looks like in God's family. There's one massive weakness and problem with this whole thing, with all these commands. These commands cannot make us righteous. If you leave here and try to obey all of these, you will not be able to. And in fact, if the harder you try to obey them, the more it'll expose how far away from God you truly are. And that's where we come to the good news of the gospel. Titus 2.14, it says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That is command number zero right there. Jesus Christ has stepped in and rescued you from sin and death and slavery, and he has made you his own possession and a people who are zealous for good works. Why did we want to start a family? Not for the rules, but for the relationships, right? And I could show you a ton of pictures of our family in action having an awesome time, taking the boys on our surf snowboard trip last spring break. It was epic. I could show you pictures of game night. I could show you pictures of family vacations, all the things. But you know what most of my life looks like as a dad? Most of my life looks like, oh, you did what last night, right? It's kids getting stuck and me showing up and rescuing them, pulling them out. Next one. I won't say who, is, who got that stuck. Um, anyway, uh, this one, Jet. We have a mowing business, and he's explaining to me why he needed to drive it through a mud field, right? He's stuck, and he's like, it's not my fault, Dad. It was, uh, I was just mowing the, you know. Like, <laughs> and I show up. I'm like, how are we getting this thing out of here? I don't know, but like, that's my job. My job is not just to do all the fun things, vacations. And guess what? You know what I do as a Christian? I drive straight into a mud pit. I'm breaking these 10 commands like nobody's business. Just today, I could probably go through and, yep, that. Did that really bad idea? Yep, that was, right? But God is a great father and he loves to just rescue us continually. It's a relationship with Jesus do you want to start a relationship with Jesus tonight? 
Do you want to be in his family? I hope that the next time someone asks you, what's this book about anyway? You can talk to him about the Lord God who rescued you from the land of Egypt out of the land of slavery and brought you in his family. Let's pray together. Jesus, I wish that I had better words to convey your love to these students. I wish that I had an even better picture to show the the picture of your love. But you left us with a cross, empty cross, and that's enough for us tonight to just look at the wonderful cross. Thank you for saving us. Lord, tonight, if there's anyone here that is not sure if they're in your family, if they're part of your family, that tonight they would just open their hands and say, Jesus, have it all. And they would begin a relationship with you. Let's respond in worship to the King of Kings.